welcome to this morning's webinar, the third in the silage series on harvesting and storage. I'm Sophia Kuzik of the Education Team in Communication and Stakeholder Engagement at the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, and I'll be your host for today. I'd like to acknowledge that as we are meeting across the state in this virtual space, each of us stand upon the lands of many different nations. I'm meeting on Gadigal land, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waterway of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters on which our online audiences are joining for us from, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend that to any First Nations colleagues and guests joining us. I'd now like to hand over to Sue Street, Livestock Senior Land Services Officer within the Central West Local Land Services, to formally introduce the session. Thanks for that. Um, so on behalf of Local Land Services, we welcome you all today um, to this webinar. Um, as it was just said, this is the third of our webinar series um, and today we will cover harvesting and storage. So this series of webinars is brought to you by Local Land Services and in particular the Ag Extension teams from across the state. So once again, I'm joined by John Piltz of New South Wales DPI, who has partnered, partnered with us to share his wealth of knowledge and experience in this area as part of this webinar series. So John is a Livestock Research Officer at New South Wales DPI, based down in Wagga. John has more than 30 years experience in, in animal nutrition and fodder conservation. He was the National Co-Coordinator of the Top Fodder Extension Program until 2005 and is author of the Successful Silage Manual. Thank you, Sue. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're on to harvesting and storage. That's where we're up to after the last two. Again, I just bring your attention that a lot of the graphs and pictures and tables that we'll see today have come out of the Successful Silage Manual. So if anybody needs to look up, get more detail or refresh, please just um, go and search it online or see LLS and they can probably organise to get you a copy. During today, I want to run through five particular components about harvesting and storage. Making silage is quite unique in that there are very many options for harvesting, very many options for storage and a raisin, range of reasons why you may have losses or storage problems. So we'll discuss all of those and then we'll follow on with the use of additives and what may or may not be the benefits of, of incorporating as additives into your system. So firstly, forage harvesting equipment. A number of various pieces of equipment have been used over the years, but the four pieces of equipment that you're probably most likely to deal with are precision or fine chop silage harvesters, forage wagons, round balers or square balers. So the first one is a precision chop forage harvester and many of the things I talk about will relate specifically to precision chop or fine chop forage because that is where a lot of the research has been done traditionally and where a lot of our results come from. But then we'll try and extrapolate onto baled silages. So the traditional trailed for forage harvester, as you can see there, sits on the back of a tractor, has a um, cutter at front and blows material into a truck or tractor or, or with a wagon uh, for carting. It's, it's probably the most common precision chop unit used on farm and it has the ability, well you have the ability to adjust the chop length from quite small up to a longer chop which you may choose to do for example with corn silage you'll go finer with uh, pasture silage it, it's more likely to cut it at around that 19 mil, 20 mil. And they're suitable um, for a range of crops, they can harvest a range of crops. If we want to get a little bit bigger, we now have self-propelled units which are essentially the same, except that they have very high capacity and they're used for large operations, feedlots in particular, or big dairies, or areas where a lot of material needs to be harvested in a fairly short period of time. Obviously they're pretty much contractors. Uh, most people would never be able to afford a forage harvester unless they've got a massive operation of their own. The, 
this unit that we can see is using a typical windrow front like a baler. It, um, it similarly is, can um, harvest a range of different crops and we'll look at a few options shortly. But the point I'd like to make about once you get into this bigger gear, it's going to take a lot more support. So the forage will come off the paddock very, very quickly. I mean, I've seen these big semi-trailers being filled seven to ten minutes. So you can imagine the, the amount of material move very quickly. In order to put that into the pit, spread it evenly and roll it, you need to have quite a number of people supporting you. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to get adequate compaction. This is a typical row front attachment. Um, you can see they are direct cutting sorghum, grain sorghum. If, um, if we use a direct cut option, we're looking at crops where we're not going to be wilting. So that's going to be things like maize, sorghums. There are other fronts available for direct cutting, which aren't designed for row crop attachments. You can you can do a search online and you'll find plenty of them. There's Kemper fronts and, and various arrangements and sim fronts similar to the front of a, for, uh, a header that will direct uh, directly harvest barley, wheat, other cereal crops. Um, so the idea again with those, they're an option for when you want to harvest cereal type crops at about 35 to 40 percent dry matter content as a direct cut option. One thing we won't go into today is the option to include additional extras in your machine. There are things like kernel processes, which are used for, for uh, sorghum, used for corn, and they damage the grain in theory, the theory being that it will release more of the starch for better utilisation. And more recently, there's a thing called shredlage, which pretty much shreds maize silage and, and is reputedly um, has a, an advantage in terms of the effect of effective utilisation of that product, product by livestock. You may see occasionally a forage wagon. These are generally lower capacity. They've got a similar windrow pickup front. They chop the material as it goes into the into the wagon itself. It is a longer chop, so and it's a lot less uh, control. So there might be materials go through that are 10, 15 mil, millimetres long, but there will be other material that might be 7.5 to 10 centimetres long. The advantage of a forage wagon is that whilst it's lower capaci capacity, it requires less people. So the same person that harvests with a forage wagon then cuts that material and unloads out of the forage wagon into the pit or the bun and the second person then rolls it. So with two people, it is pretty um, easy to, to manage but your th work rate is lower and you do need to site the storage pretty close to the paddock you're cutting otherwise you're going to be looking at a very long downtime driving the tractor backwards and forward. So cutting one in the side of the same paddock is, is probably the best option if you can. While chop silage is the traditional, increasingly people are using balers, both round balers and square balers. And particularly in Australia, round bale and square bale silage has become very popular and quite common. I attribute that to the fact that people have, often have the equipment to handle baled silages because they're traditionally handling hay or something similar. All you really can need is a, is a tractor with a, a set of forks on the front and it makes it a little bit easier for people to get into the silage system. This example that we've got here is a round baler which includes or incorporates uh, wrapping mechanism at the same time. Now these are not very common but you will see them. As the bale is produced it's then moved at the back, the bale is wrapped and then it's um, expelled out onto that mat that you can see there and left behind. A couple of points I'd like to make about that. Firstly that mat is critically important because you can imagine that the, the stubble left behind on the paddock is sometimes quite sharp. 
and can very easily puncture plastic. Second point is you then need to move those bales to a point of storage, which means there is opportunity for those bales to be further punctured by the equipment you're using. So while there are one-person operation bale plus wrapper, they do have a couple of downsides. Alternatively, and more commonly, people in Australia are going towards big square silages, particularly people in the beef and sheep industries, less so perhaps in, in the dairy industry. The beauty of big square bales is they have really high throughput rates, higher than round bales. They are generally operated by a contractor because the machinery costs are probably at least double the, for a baler, but you can handle a lot of material quickly and you do have a much range, greater range of storage options. Essentially what you do is you get a baler that's, that's set up um, and to, to produce silage so it, it can cope with, with wetter material and you make a shorter bale which whereas traditionally a bar might be eight foot long, a silage bar might be six foot, five and a half foot. The concept is simply that the weight of silage is going to be much higher because it contains a proportion of um, water in it. Last week we were talking about it's about 50% water, 50% dry matter. A really long bar on a set of forks is heavy and there's always a risk of it slumping over the edges. Once we've decided the system that we want to use, there are a couple of other considerations. Firstly, proximity to feed outside. Most people would, would be of the same opinion that it's much easier to cart material to a central point that is convenient for feeding out silage rather than cart the material to a single point and then have to transport it later for feeding. The exception obviously is forage wagons, but I meant before. So choose a site that's pretty centrally located on your farm or centrally located to the areas where you will be feeding out because you move a large amount quickly, uh, particularly with trucks, if you're making silage, but you move, lose, move a lot lesser amount more slowly when you're feeding out. Please make sure that wherever you locate it, you've got easy and safe access for the harvest and feed out equipment. Don't try and ram it into a little area between trees that may or may not have issues in terms of uh, risk of running into them, um, risk of them falling on the, on the pits or the bunkers, and most importantly, keep away from power lines. I personally have seen the situation where somebody has been carting chopped silage to put in a bun and have been regularly doing it over the course of the day and then at the end as the bun got a bit longer they got a little bit tired, started to raise the tipper and got very close to hitting a power line. So please consider that. The other thing is away from the house. If you make silage there will be an odour the silage might smell all right, but the little bit of dead and decaying material that gets left lying around won't, and it will attract flies. So you don't really want that near your house. The other thing is keep it away from wet or flood plain areas. Now, in terms of chopped silage, particularly underground chopped silage, the problem is once water gets into the silage, it becomes uh, unstable, and it also starts to deteriorate. With the case of bale silages, flood prone is probably more of a risk where you see bales actually washed wash down the river as during a flood. So keep them in a high patch of ground away from any risks. Obviously away from waterways if it's good, but also away from underground cables, fence lines, anything that could cause problems later on. So we've now made our silage, we've made a decision, how can we store it? Um, this is an example of a large pit silage. Point of this silage is it's, it is very, very big. Um, this is an incredibly large silage pit. It's a maize silage pit, obviously from a, an operation where they're looking at production feeding. And as a result, they're moving the material very, very quickly. Talk about that a little bit later about the importance of managing 
your silage or design to, to optimize waste losses during feed out. Now, in this case, uh, the person is using a coverage of plastic and tyres because it is being regularly fed out. It's, it's essentially being used for shorter term storage, but pit silage has been chosen as the option because it suits the, the aims and the objectives of that operation. Alternatively, if you want to fit, use this for long term storage, then cover it with some dirt. A couple of points I would make. First thing is, silages will tend to slump. So when you make your silage in a pit, it is not a bad idea, particularly for longer term storage, to have the silage at least as high or probably higher than the surrounding area. But then make sure there is a good layer of dirt over the cross. And I'm talking at least 30 to centimetres. So you want at least that 30 centimetres foot of coverage to ensure that the plastic is protected. If you use, and I should say, if you use um, pit silage and, you, and you're going to cover it with dirt, it is still important to use a layer of plastic. Plastic, apart from your air seal, it also stops water. So if you can imagine some soils are reasonably impervious to ingress by or water or air getting into them, but others do have um, do allow a certain amount of air or a certain amount of water to penetrate them and you don't want to get that into your silage so the plastic will help there. The second point to mention is that if that material slumps and it becomes less than gr ground level, you end up with a hollow. So if there is a hollow and no plastic underneath, then you will get water pooling and that water will penetrate into the solid. It's also important to maintain that silage pit, even when it's covered with soil, by regularly inspecting it. To, to see, for example, there are no rabbit holes that have dug into it, to see that there has been no cracking, so that the soil hasn't opened up and there's a risk that air and, pet and water can penetrate in. The other option we've got if we're making chopped silage is rather than actually dig into the ground or dig into the side of the hill, we can create a hill. All that happens, all we do is mount up some dirt on either side, so we drag it in from the surrounding area and build a wall, two wall structure, drive-through option, and then we can either cover that with plastic and tyres for short-term storage or plastic and dirt for longer-term storage. This is a particularly valuable option in areas where the topography is pretty flat and there's a risk of water lying around. So, for example, if you talk about areas out on western New South Wales where the ground is quite flat and you're probably looking at making silage more as a drought storage, one option is to dig a hole in the ground and fill it with silage. However, when it rains in very um, flat country, as we all know, the water can tend to lay there and it will percolate down into the soil and it will then penetrate into that pit from the side so you will get damage to the silage. So therefore, keep it above that, that potential water infiltration. Ground seepage is definitely recommended. If we've got a big enough operation and we're feeding silage regularly enough, then ultimately it may be worth considering going for something like a concrete bunker. You're more likely to see these on street dairy farms where silage is fed six, seven, eight or even more months of the year. The advantages of the concrete bunkers are they're a permanent storage site but they require little maintenance. So even if we put silage into a bunker underground, into a pit underground, or build up wall sides and make a bunker, eventually some of the sides will collapse or some of the dirt will sl slump into the area where the silage is as we're removing it. So uh, at reasonably regular intervals, you may be required to get somebody in there and clean that dirt out and look at um, 
refreshing your silage pits. Now, the other big advantage, obviously, with concrete bunkers is because they're all concrete, the concrete floor doesn't matter so much if it rains. So it, you could imagine in an, in an operation where feeding silage routinely throughout several months of the year is part of your standard practice, then having a concrete bunker offers some significant benefits in terms of access or weather access. Again, good, best option, but uh, probably only going to be suitable your use by people who regularly feed silage or particularly regularly feed silage in area times of the year where wet, um, high rate levels, high rainfall is, is likely to cause some problem. Two points to with that is, firstly, um, you still need to have a slope on that concrete floor so that any rainfall, any water that does fall will come back out. The second point and we, on that is that as we, uh, people that move towards concrete bunkers, there is an increasing reliance on or increasing emphasis on OH&S safety and you may find that if you construct these, make sure you get approval from your local authorities on what you're doing and you may need to even have some safety rails off the top so that you don't fall over the edges when you're rolling. So design kit considerations, we took that groundwater seeping into the silage. The second one is width. The width of a silage pit, silage bunker is going to determine um, how fast we go back or how much of that silage we remove in terms of centimetres back or every, every time we feed. So, so a silage bunker that's three metres wide will go backwards twice as fast as a silage bunker that's six metres wide if you're feeding the same amount out daily. And that becomes important because once we're feeding the silage is exposed to the air and the air will mean that the silage will start to deteriorate. It will start to become unstable, which you'll tell, be able to tell because it's heating. In webinar four, we'll look at some data about the impact of heating on, on animal production. But in simple terms, silage that heats tends to support lower intakes and lower growth rates or lower milk production. So, in summary, make your pit, your bunker, or design your 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 um, storage so that it's relatively narrow and deep and long, rather than a huge wide face where it takes you a long time to get across and remove the material. However, remember it's got to be at least one point eight or two tractor widths wide, because when you're rolling. You're always rolling up and down. You've got no other option. And if it isn't wide enough, there will be a period, uh, there will be a section in the middle where there won't be any tractor wheels, so there won't be any compaction. So therefore, you will end up with the, or the risk is you'll end up with a, an area of top material that's poorly compacted, a lot of air, more likely to go mouldy, more likely to be problems when you feed it out. If people choose to go down the chop silage but they're not looking for long-term storage and they're not looking for constructing either a silage pit or a, or above ground um, bunker, then one option is simply to make a bun. Buns work very, very well. The material is just dropped, spread out, to ensuring that it's not too wide for the plastic coverage you choose to use and then it's rolled. The difference with a bun is obviously that you can roll across which as the buns get taller and they tend to be steeper is a good option from a safety point of view because you could imagine that as the sides get steep it's not feasible to, to um, drive lengthways with a tractor because there's a fairly significant risk of toppling over and, and that's obviously not recommended. They are suitable 
for shorter term storage than pits because you don't cover them in soil. They don't have that extra protection. Generally, I would say they'd be appropriate for a regular feeding program where silage is fed out every during as part of the normal annual cycle on the farm. But you would be able to probably get away with a long, slightly longer period of storage than that with this because the plastic is integrity is reasonable. What I would suggest though is if you make silage like this, because and, and it, remember it does have the advantage you don't need to construct a pit or anything to do it. So you can if it, you decide to make chopped silage, you can you can pretty well do it anyway. If you do go down that way and you're not sure you're going to feed out in the next 12 or 18 months, then if you put a second layer of old plastic over the top, is not a bad idea and certainly cover it pretty well because what you're trying to do is reduce the sunlight hitting the, the key layer of plastic over the, that's sealing the, plastic, the silage because sunlight, the UV rays will actually break down plastic and we know what happens to plastic bags and things outside after a while, they just disintegrate and obviously that will happen to silage plastics as well and then air gets in. There are also some new plastic and covering options available and I haven't personally used these, I have seen them, they do sound very uh, user friendly and people that use them are quite happy with them. They generally involve a thinner layer of plastic over the bunker and then covered with a heavier um, sheet which is more like to feel it's more like a shake off. Now the, the reported advantage of that thin layer of plastic underneath is it is totally impervious to oxygen. Now, all plastic will allow some oxygen transfer and later on we'll see what the implications of that are. So if you have a layer of plastic, some oxygen will, will there are micro pores and some oxygen will transfer through that. What we have traditionally done with the black and white plastic is we've used two or three layers of plastic laminated and by doing that work on the basis that those micropores aren't going to line up and so the amount of air that transfers from one to the other is negligible and that's pretty much evidenced by the lack of waste that we get in a well sealed pit. However, this other sheet is just a single sheet and claims the same thing. The other option that goes with that is to use the heavier shape cloth type sheet and then use bags full with sand rather than solid, sorry, rather than, than tyres for weighting. Weighting's really important. Weighting brings the plastic into contact with the silage or the forage at the time and prevents, um, prevents any billowing of the plastic sheet and build up of oxygen and, oxygen and gases at the top. It also has the advantage that if there is a small hole that develops in the plastic, it, it doesn't tend to billow as much because it's weighted down. If you can imagine that silage is covered by plastic which, which hasn't, isn't adequately weighted down, and the wind's blowing, that will start to flap. So if that slide hole starts to let air in, it will gradually act like a bit of a bellows and it will suck the air in and continually start to degrade the plastic. So therefore, putting the tyres on works really well. The other thing to remember is that when you make silage, ideally you don't get heating, but in practice you will get some heating, but more importantly you will get some build-up of gases which will expand up to the surface. And they will tend to create a gap between the silage and the silage plastic unless they're weighted down properly. The risk with that, and it's probably most evident in square bar modules, is there tends to be a build up of moisture, probably oxygen, which leads to a, a, an area of um, 
deterioration, damage, which you wouldn't normally see in a well-weighted silage. It's, it, 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 I can, I explain it by saying it allows for an, a pocket of air and moisture concentrated at one spot in the bunker or the bun, which allows for that damage to occur. So if we look at what we've got here, I would say the one on the left is not covered with sufficient tyres because it runs the risk that there won't be enough pressure on it, on the plastic. However, if you look at the one on the right, I would say they've done a pretty good job. Which means we're coming to square bar modules. Now, as I mentioned before, square bars have a number of storage options that round bar solicitors don't have. One of these is storing them in modules. Now, modules have one major advantage. They allow people to produce square bale silages relatively inexpensively, and so they're able to try square bale silage and silage in general to see how it fits within their farming operation. However, there's a couple of points with making square bale silage. The first one is they're only suitable for short-term storage. They've, they've only got um, a one layer of plastic generally. It's difficult to weight them down at the top and the sides are not protected at all. It's very difficult to exclude all the air at the time when you're making them because despite your best effort, every bale will not be exactly the same length. Therefore, you could imagine that uh, down the sides there will be a gap between the bale and the plastic which allows air to penetrate. The implication of that is if you get a hole in the plastic or once the stack is open, any air penetration isn't just at the site where the hole is or at the face after you've opened it. The, the air will penetrate all the way around that solid stack. So the last bale will be starting to deteriorate the from the moment that you open that stack. It also means that you've got to be extremely vigilant to make sure you patch any holes if they get in the plastic. The other risk with them is that because they don't can't have that weight or that you don't have weight all over them like you do over pits, if you get a hole in them and it is windy, they will tend to billow a lot more. So they'll tend to suck air in as the plastic flaps. A um, couple of other points. Um, because of that air ingress, that air entering as soon as it's open, the recommendation for how big those modules are is declining and it's probably started out at two weeks, it's down to 10 days or even less. So only store a small amount of, of silage in one of the modules. In terms of weight, you can put plastic um, tires on top of the plastic, but one alternative would be to get some strips of plastic, lay them over the top and weight them down on the edges with either a tire or a drum full of water or something like that. Anything you can just to keep some weight both on the top and perhaps a little bit down the side. The other point I would make is that when you make those stacks, rather than start in the middle, it's, it's, for example, if you're going three wide, one in the middle, one on either side, a bale on either side, start in the corner and work to the work out so that the side where the first bar was placed becomes relatively flat and any unevenness caused by the different sizes of the bars is all restricted to one side. So you, you're slightly limiting the amount of air that can penetrate after opening because it only happens to, the same, to that normal extent on one side. Um, the other option with with above ground modules is, and this also occurs within pits, if you want, rather than have the gap like we see on, on the flight on the left or the photo on the left between the bales, one option is to 
build one, your first module, run it down, run the plastic down and run it out. So you can see that white plastic, the white top layer that's coming out. Then start with another layer of plastic and build your next module so that it's hard up against that first module. What that means is you've got less area to, to worry about in terms of maintaining um, maintaining weeds or controlling weeds and less area for vermin to probably get in and cause problems. But ultimately, if you're looking for longer term storage, bars in a pit work really, really well. When I, my advice when if you're going to go down for bales in a pit, which you could use for long term storage or short term storage, is make sure the pit's a little bit wider than the bales or the number of bales you plan to put in the put in the pit. So, for example, if you want to go four bales wide, allow about 10, 15 centimetres extra width on either side, and rather than stacking into a corner like the modules stack into the centre. That means that when you finish, there will be a gap down either side of the pit. But we're going to do two things. We're firstly going to cover it with plastic like chopped silage. So if we start the pit and we lay some plastic partly, partly um, down the side of the back of the pit, put our bars in, we roll our plastic forward, then we can either get to the end of the mod of the pit and say that's it, or we can do it in modules similar to the diagram we had before. And then we put the plastic so it's hanging down the sides. And once that's done, we fill that back up with dirt, and that compacts down in and prevents air getting into the bales from the side. And you can see there, looking at that picture, those bales are pretty good. I can't really see any damage or any discoloration in, in the silage that's there. A couple other points with storage, storing bales in pits or big square bales in pits. Again, probably go half a bale higher than the surrounding ground when you first start because they will slump somewhat and you don't want to end up with a hollow that's going to allow water to pool. Obviously, mate, just keep an eye on it and if needs be, fill it up with um, more dirt. Just top it up so it's mounted and it sheds water. But works extremely well and is is a, um, a good alternative to the more... Ex more or the less reliable I suppose you'd say the less longer it's a long -term op op longer term storage option compared to the round the, the square bars in modules here's just a diagram of what I mean by the plastic sheet now it doesn't really matter whether you do this in a pit which is the example given here or in modules outside you can see it's all going to have a similar um, design and it will certainly reduce the amount of gap between them. The beauty of for in the pit, it means that if you are not if you have a large pit and you're going to feed for a certain period of time, but you're unsure whether you're going to need to feed the whole pit, by having dividers going along as you go backwards, you can more easily get to a point and say, there is now enough paddock feed or for whatever reason I don't want to feed any longer and you just stop at that point. Now a final option is we go down to individually wrapped bales. Now these are the shortest term storage because the plastic breaks down quickly with UV light. You can do these in round bales or square bales which we'll look at in a minute. The rules are the same though. Um, Ideally wrap at the storage site to prevent plastic damage during transport. If you pick them up and move them, they are potentially going to get a hole in them. And a very small hole will lead to some place, some mould and waste. Similarly, you need to be vigilant and probably even more vigilant than the other forms, certainly the, the top silage storage systems, because you have a very relatively small amount of silage which can be affected by that small hole.
An alternative option, which will save plastic because the individual bales are the most ex expensive in terms of plastic usage, as you can imagine. You can wrap those in a, a line. So that's reputedly going to stop, use about 40% plas less plastic than individual wrap bars. And you can do them for round bars or square bars. Square bars are usually two bars high. That's a wrapper design for smaller round bars. The ones for square round bars don't always do square bars. The ones for square bars should do round bars. Um, that's an inline system, and the bars pretty much get sat on the on the machinery. They move, and the machine itself actually moves along as the bale is wrapped, and the bales drop off the back. There are also options for using bags, and bags can. There are even bags that you can put chop silage in, similar to grain, or you can put uh, just the bars in. So you can see there's lots of storage options, options. But that's what we can do. Let's have a look at what happens when we make the silage in terms of losses during the storage. We discussed effluent before. We. It may be significant, but we also worked out in the last couple that if we ensure dry matter percentage above 30%, it shouldn't be an issue. There will be some air present at the time you install the material, and that will cause respiration. And the respiration is going to occur till that air is used up, and you can't do much about it other than pack the pit quickly and as well as you can, and we'll look at that impact later on. The other, the other thing is aerobic spoilage will happen once you've got air present. Um, again, we'll look at the, some examples of that. There will also be some fermentation losses. They're usually small. They're avoidable. We did look at them in the last couple of weeks, and we will also look at one option to potentially um, reduce those. So... Respiration losses, what happens? Well, it's the same story as we've had before. When you get plant sugars and you've got oxygen, they produce carbon dioxide, heat and water. And they, you lose plant sugars for fermentation, you lose ME and dry matter, and you also get some heating, which if it is really bad, you will cause caramelisation, a reduction in the protein availability and the ME, which we talked about before. Now... In terms of um, how we manage that, it is, and, sorry, and we'll go on, and aerobic spoilage is after the respiration has ceased, in a sense, once the silage is, fermentation is finished, aerobic spoilage you, you will occur due to poor exclusion of air. It's the biggest management failure in a silage system because it leads to the decomposition, therefore loss of silage dry matter and energy, and it also encourages the growth of anaerobic organisms, yeast and moles, which then present a problem when you're feeding out later because they cause the silage to be less stable. So, so how do we avoid that? Firstly, Exclude, again, we're at chop silages. Exclude as much air as possible. So a short chop length, correct dry matter content. Fill the stacks rapidly. Keep up with rolling and roll slowly and use a heavy tractor. Heavy tractor, I mean one where the weight, relative weight on the, on the tyres in contact with the silage is heavy. You can have some very, very big tractors, but if they've all got dual wheels and wide tyres, then you're probably not any better off than a smaller tractor with narrow wheels where there's a lot more weight at the point of contact. Uh, spread it evenly, which we talked about briefly before. Ideally, no more than 150 mil or six inches thick. You can see now why with, you, with those big systems where you have self-propelled forage harvesters and the material is moving very, very quickly, it becomes very, very difficult to maintain that rolling and that compression to the level that you want. So you need to be conscious of that. Avoid getting mud into the silage. Mud itself 
isn't a good thing uh, because it reduces the quality of the material where it falls. But more importantly, mud contains bacteria. It's also a source of um, the undesirable organisms such as the Clostridia. So it, it can lead to a poorer fermentation. So we just avoid that. And the other thing would be if you're making a bigger stack, that's fine, but cover it overnight. So as the stack gets bigger and bigger and bigger, um, the material underneath is progressively covered by more silage, and so it's reasonably well protected. But then at the at the end of the day, if you choose to stop for 10 or 12 hours, cover that and just put a little bit of light weight on that so the plastic doesn't blow up. Incidentally, on that, if you're making a pit, it is worth filling it in what we call a wedge. So as you could either have the silage being filled over the whole length, which you would, for example, with a bun, but you may choose just to add the material so that you're progressively moving out further and further along the pit by filling it up to the top of the pit in a wedge type form coming out. In which case, once you fill that component up, if you cover that bit overnight, there's no real need to uncover it again. You may, at the end, choose to do one final roll over the whole lot, but that's probably not essential. So in that case, I would leave that component covered up. So one of the things that we wanted to do is keep air out. And what you can see here are two bun silage buns. One's, one's on out in the paddock and one's on, on paving or concrete. That in itself isn't so much the issue. But what you can see is we want to keep the air out to reduce the losses. The picture on the left is well covered in tyres. The plastic is buried into the ground. And because it's a single sheet, there's very, very little chance of air getting in there unless there's a hole. The picture on the right, however, you've got loose plastic, you've got very few tyres, and all you've got is plastic laying on concrete or pavers with some forage weighting it down. Air will penetrate in that. Furthermore, when air wind blows across that, that plastic will flap and it will act like a bellows and it will, will suck the material in. So if you've gone to all the hassle of making it, please seal it properly, otherwise you're in trouble. Now, we, we have a qu question here, or we have a series of questions. One, what time, what do I refer to as short, medium and long-term storage? Short term is being fed out within the next 12, maybe 18 months, in, in my opinion. Uh, medium term storage would mean that it will probably be suitable for two to three, maybe four years, depending on how well the plastic lasts. And longer term storage is essentially indefinite. Uh, it could be 60, 70 years. It, how long will individual bales last while retaining reasonable feed value? and what is the best way to repair holes. The second plate will do shortly. They will retain feed value uh, while ever the airtight seal is maintained. The problem with those individual bars is maintaining that seal is, is short term. Um, how big are the losses for those who chop silage into a pit, but the pit is that big it takes three days to fill and get seal, sealed? Okay, back to what I just said. If you Put your silage down, in, your forage down in such a way that you're building on top all the time. Then the material that's down the bottom is pretty well protected and it shouldn't cause any real losses or any major additional losses. And it's the standard we have to do and we've done for years. Alternatively, if you do the pit, do the wedge thing and make sure the plastic's over. The difference in fee value between chopped silage and baled silage um, comes back, in my opinion, comes back primarily to whether or not you may have additional losses from the bale system because you've produced the material when it's drier. Other than that, if you conceptually could have two silages that were the same, the quality losses 
should be very, very similar. However, in terms of what you would really notice. What we do know, though, is with chopped silage, the fermentation proceeds much more quickly than with the baled silage. And that's based on very little data at where chopped silage and baled silage at the same dry matter content have been compared in bales. And what you'll see is the pH drops much more slowly in the baled silage. Now, whether that's going to lead to significantly greater losses is doubtful, but we really don't know. We really have no idea whether or not that's going to be uh, a major effect or not. And when you take into account the fact that baled silages are generally made at about 50% when the dry matter content pretty much restricts the fermentation. There is very little fermentation. That's why I come back and say that the chopped silage and bale silage difference is primarily going to be dry matter which made it. I will put in the proviso, and I can't answer this, and I don't know of anyone that can, and that is whether or not if you were to produce two silages at the same dry matter content, one chopped, one not chopped, whether or not there would be more protein degradation in the barred silage. And the reason why that may be so is that one of the things that stops uh, protein degradation with occurring is a, a more rapid drop in pH. Partly it's because air is used up and there's very little or no respiration. And that occurs because of the plant enzymes, not because of the bacteria. The other way is because pH falls below 5, once it's below 5, you don't get very much protein degradation. But we do know that a lot of chopped silage, uh, sorry, a lot of other silages are made well out with pHs well over 5, and the protein fraction still seems to be reasonable, which would say to me that the air is used up pretty quickly and the main thing stopping any degradation is probably the fact that there is no fermentation happening, there is no respiration happening. So simple answer is probably just stick to the fact that at this stage in the lack of any other data, it's probably just the dry matter effect. Uh, but he, what I've got here is I'm actually looking at a picture, and this is obviously a real silage pit, which has come, and it probably came from a, a pit that didn't look that different to the one in the slide above, which wasn't well sealed. What you'll get is you'll get these layers, decomposing mouldy layer at the top. You'll see that on bale silage, it's two big squares in modules. And again, I'll put it down to that condensation and little pocket of air forming at the top. You'll get a black layer, which is obviously being degraded and often slimy. But the other thing you'll get is this discoloured heating layer underneath. Now, we do know, and we'll look at some figures next week, but we do know that that material has undergone some deterioration in terms of energy. So, so even though um, you might look and say, well, there's a little bit of waste at the top and it's not really such a big deal, we do know that it, it's a big deal because it has led to impacts all the way down. The other one I missed there, best aim to fill a pit, one pit in a day. Uh, if you're up and going and that suits your system and it's going to give you something that probably matches well with your feeding system, it's a good way to go. If you're doing bales in a pit, certainly I would look to the modules, internal modules, so you'll get that done. But if you're doing um, top silage, Probably not a bad way to do it, but not an essential. Uh, the other thing I want to look at is silage density affects dry matter losses, which again, we'll probably skip through this pretty quickly, but again, this is chopped silage. And we know that if you get denser silage packed better, and we, you'll get less air penetration, so therefore you get lo lower spoilage, you'll get more material in your pit or your bunker, and you'll end up with 
a silage it's probably got it should have less molds less yeast and when you open it up it'll be more stable and just to give you an idea of what you can get this is this is um some silages from the us where they looked at making some i think it's 47 different silages and they measured the density of loosen it was a loosen and losses after 180 days of ensiling in bags and you can see there this is bag, so it's it's probably protecting it a little bit in terms of a good system to stop air getting in. Uh, as density in kilograms of dry matter cu per cubic meter increases, losses decline. So they're effectively losses related to the air that's trapped at the time of ensiling. Now, ideally, silages should be around that. 225 to 250 kilos of dry matter. A well-made silage is going to be there. The ones that that 350, um, that's fine, really fine chopped and very, very well compacted. Um, but you can see if you can achieve it, you will increase, re reduce your losses. The, the other thing is we, this is also data which shows the effect of um, dry matter content or the range in dry matter content, density and chop length that you can get. And this is from 168 bunker silos in the US. Now you've got some which are hay crop, like what they call hay crop is mainly loosened, but it could be timothy and a few other types of pastures uh, or maize silage. And you can see there that um, there's, they're very similar between the two in terms of dry matter density and for the, the hay crop and the um, maize silage, 237 versus 232, and the chop lengths are very, very similar, but there is a huge range. That density ranging from 106 to 434 in the hay crop or 125 to 378. So what's out there is a huge range and that range we just saw does impact on losses. Two points to get out of this. One is the effect of sugar content, water-soluble carbohydrate content on the speed at which fermentation occurs and also the impact of delayed sealing. So what you can see there is experiment one, 27% sugar content, experiment two, less sugar content, only 11%. So the pH um, with for the 27% at the surface and deeper down was lower. It's only slightly lower, but it was lower than for the experiment two, which translated into uh, lower losses in experiment one than experiment two. Probably though the biggest thing to take out of this because ultimately the sugar content is either going to be dictated by the seasonal conditions or the crop or pasture we're harvesting. The biggest thing to take out is if you delay sealing and unlike what we were talking about before where you're continually filling so you're covering up material all the time this is effectively making the silage in and then taking the weekend off and coming back on Monday and putting the plastic over it. You'll see that it had a big impact on, on pH, particularly at this, um, in experiment two where you had less sugar, but more importantly, it'll increase your losses. So fine if you're continually filling over three days, but once you fill, seal very, very quickly. The same thing is true for bales. Really, losses start to occur from the moment it's baled because it's going to start to warm up. Everyone knows that once you bale some material, it doesn't really matter what it is. You will get heating to occur fairly quickly. So wrap as quickly as you can. Wrap at the storage site, like I said before, so you don't run the risk of puncturing it. 12-month storage, sufficient layers of plastic, and make sure the, lumber, the plastic is applied evenly. And we'll look at a couple of things about that. Firstly, remember I mentioned before the plastic's not impervious and you do get some oxygen passing through. 
or with wrapped bile silages, it's a relatively thin layer of plastic which is stretched and the level of uh, and the quantity of stretch will depend on manufacturer recommendation. But it will be stretched and you will get ideally for some people even say six layers of film. But there is some impact of air penetrating that, sil that plastic where the layers of film are not enough. So if we look at that, this is an Irish study where they looked at the impact of two layers versus four layers. Looked at the average amount of mould and rotted area and digestibility. And you can see that there's a clear difference in favour of putting four rows on in terms of average mould depth, average amount of materials rotted and digestibility. Now, I wouldn't personally be overly happy with even what they got in four, but you, what you can see too is there's quite a significant loss there, which means that over time there's a lot of this oxygen moving backwards and forwards in. So we look at a couple of problems. Where we've got unevil plastic wrapping, so if you've got a wrap bar, you want four layers, but you want four layers over every single part of that bale because you can see quite clearly the different colour striations in the bales where it's four layers and two layers, and this is what you get. You get mould penetrated because air is penetrated through the two layers. The other problem is if you do a really crap job and the bales are very, very soft, you'll get this slumping means you'll have air there, it means there'll probably be mould as well, but when the bale slumps, if it collapses, and particularly if you've got it laying on, on the, the round end, there's a risk that that will stretch or break that plastic and let air in. Another good reason why you would store on the, on the flat end. Same thing can, can, occur, can occur if it's too wet. Also the same problem if you've got wrapping bars in a tube line wrapper, but they're all uneven sizes. You can imagine that where the bales are all very similar, the plastic is all stretched at the same amount, but where you've got differences, where you've got big bales, there might be more stretching, but particularly where you've got a big bale and a smaller bale, the area between the, the sort of the side area between the big bale and the little bale, you will have uneven plastic stretching and you'll probably have, uh, you will have more stretched plastic so you will get more air in. So try and maintain bales. Bale integrity in terms of shape, evenness of size is important. Sometimes people will understretch their plastic and it doesn't grip properly, it doesn't stick well and there's a more chance of it falling to pieces and they're getting in. Sometimes you will see bales where forage has been allowed to stick out everywhere and it becomes trapped between the layers of plastic and sometimes even sticking out past the plastic so that's not in the, in the bale itself, that's going to let air in. It, this is a much less common problem now that we use net wrap because it does a pretty good job but there is still some incidences of it um, the other advantage of net wrap compared to the old string system too is that where you you don't have that area where the string is where it's the bale is constricted which allows for air to circulate around there which particularly if you get a small hole is a real problem Grub holes, um, it does happen. It's probably from Gippsland where it's it's not uncommon. Uh, two things, store on the flat end because they've got thicker plastic. St store on the flat end anyway uh, because it's thicker, more UV resistance because you've got more layers of plastic. Um, birds are an issue. Foxes are an issue. Um, rabbits are an issue. Anything that can damage the plastic, even a tiny pinhole. And it might be surprising, but if you look at those tiniest holes that you can see there, in six months' time, that may be 
represent a handful of more of mould because the air will get in and slowly start to work its way through the bale. As the mould area increases, the amount of material that's decayed and rotten will be will be um, greater and there'll be more air space in there and it'll just feed on itself. Pretty obvious, but it does happen, particularly if cows like your, your silage and they'll still smell it through the plastic. This is what I mean by UV degradation. It's a lot of money to make bales and wrap them, so ensure that they can be used within the 12 months. There are options like covering them with a second layer of plastic if need be to reduce that UV degradation. Um, I have heard of people trying to start talking about storing them in sheds and things like that. Consider all the pros and cons of whatever you want to do, but whatever happens, the go is you really need to um, be aware that UV degradation will be significant and it'll tend to happen across all the bales pretty much at once. So all of a sudden you'll end up with a lot of bales that need to be handled pretty quickly. I think we've had a stuff up there with another one. Um, now, a couple of things about plastic and sealing them. There was a question before. But the rule's pretty simple. Firstly, buy proper plastic that for patching silage. You can go and you can buy rolls of silage patching tape, which um, are designed specifically for silage. We used to use duct tape because we had very little options, but we it was a relatively short-term option before it fell off, like in that picture there. The, when we've applied the tape, we buy a tape that's the same colour as the plastic that we're patching. So white buns, we use white tape. Pink ones, we use pink tape. And the reason for that is when these patches are sitting out in the sun so they're going to get hotter during the day and then cooler during the night. You can imagine that if you have a black patch on a white background the black will absorb more heat and will try and expand more than the white plastic and at night they will, they will, it will shrink again. So you end up with this movement which eventually leads to the patch becoming loose and maybe developing a little air hole in it under, between the contact points and so therefore it's a good idea to, to use the same pilot plastic. The other thing is before you put, make, put the plastic on, just make sure the air is clean and dry. So you don't want any dust and dirt that's going to be any risk limitation to the sticking occurring. So wipe it down, let it get dry. Then determine how much tape you need. So if you need a length of tape of 20 centimetres, cut your 20 centimetres. But when you put it on, don't stretch it. Pro Lay the plastic down and smooth it over the, the whole area. A, similar to the heat thing, if the plastic is stretched, it's going to be trying to compact, contract differently to the plastic. So as it heats and cools, you're going to have the same issues. Um, the... the a uh, question I've got here, what are the animal welfare issues of mouldy silage? Example, listeria. Look, there, there are issues with mouldy silage. Just, um, there are issues with mouldy hay. What I would say is it's very difficult to, to know just by looking whether something's dangerous or, or damaging or not. Um, silage or for hay... The colour of the mould does not have any impact. It, it, you can get poisonous moulds of any colour and safe moulds or relatively safe moulds of any colour. My understanding of the topic is a bit restricted, but the moulds, moulds produce a compounds called mycotoxins. And depending on who and what you read, you'll, you'll get estimates of there's about between two and 300,000 mycotoxins produced by moulds in the world means it's very difficult to test for them. There are some testing you can get done at Werribee 
to look at mulch, but ultimately it's very um, much hit and miss because you may have a different poison to or toxin there than the one they test for. It's probably going to cost you $900 to get a test. And even the same mould, and again, this is in my understanding, the same mould may or may not um, cause problems. It just depends whether or not they produce that mycotoxin or maybe that mycotoxin is in big enough quantity. What I would say, though, is the issue um, with with um, moulds and mycotoxins is, well, we'll get some data next week, but firstly, the reduction in animal production by, from mycotoxins, which is obviously difficult to see in many cases. But more importantly, it, it could be a case of if it's horrible mouldy silage, it's probably got very little or no feed value in it. So you've made something that's it's useless for your animal. The advice, again, we'll go into more detail next week, but the advice is don't force stock to eat mould and definitely don't feed mouldy silage to um, hungry stock. Specific one that Martin mentions there is listeria. Listeria causes abortions. Uh, if if um, you were concerned, like you had very degraded mouldy silages and things like that, I would certainly be um, reticent to feed that to pregnant stock, particularly pregnant ewes because sheep are more susceptible. And it, to me, it's probably not worth the risk. Feed it later when there's not, not the risk of losing pregnancy and also when you can feed it so that it's only part of their diet and they're not forced to eat it. But again, difficult to say. Listeria is one of those um, microorganisms that is ubiquitous in the environment. It's around. It becomes a problem when numbers build up and, and under certain conditions. It became really problematic when people started using big square, big sorry, big round bale silages in bags where there wasn't the good plastic seal up against the the, uh, the silage. The the other one, which is where we're up to anyway, is plastic recycling. Um, what do we do now? This comes up quite regularly and it seems that various organisations do have a go at trying to to do something about it. My advice is check with your local council or land care group. For example, I know Holbrook Land Care Group does or did have um, a program in place at looking at recycling plastic. Uh, the only operation that I'm currently aware of is a... Um, a, a group called Plastic F Forests, Plastic Forests, I think, in Aubrey. They they handle recycle plastic, uh, silage plastics, but I think they used to be, it may still be one on the mid, in the central coast, the mid-north coast or somewhere. But check with your council, check with your land care group to see what options exist in your area. The other thing is, whatever the, whatever the organisation is that may be recycling, they have real difficulty with dirty plastics. So try and keep dirt and, and silage contamination to a minimum. Ideally, if you can wash it, otherwise they have to wash it. Definitely no rocks or other particles, steel or whatever in there. Keep string and net wraps up because they're recycled differently. And if you can, compress it into a wool pack or a bulk of bag or something. Uh, one idea I did see that I thought was pretty good, which was for round bale silage, was that when the plastic came off one bale, it was folded up and put on put on the ground, and the next day's bale was put on top of that. That compacted it, and so eventually it's just built up a whole stack of compressed plastic. But that, that's about all we can do at the moment um, is contact someone local. OHNS, I mentioned um, the rails. That's, that's a bunker or solid concrete pit bunker with rails around it because, remember, you are right up high and if those pits are two or three metres tall, it's a long way to fall off the edge. Uh, certainly no children. Look up and live. Power lines are a real issue. 
stop machines when working on so all the standard rules that we need to follow use ample light at night take regular breaks and beware of machinery and make sure that the people that are working with you know what they're doing they're well trained and supervised it's not enough anymore just to get someone off the street the additives again in our last 10 minutes we'll we'll just talk about one of those and that's the inoculant but what you should be aware of is there have been a lot of different types of additives used in Australia but more traditionally in Europe and other countries other areas and bit more detailed explanation of them was all in the manual that's the categories they're broken down into but in Australia at the moment there's probably only inoculants which are actively being marketed and used within our solid systems and what they do and I often get asked to we use them what an inoculant does it loads up the um, silage with the right bacteria so it improves the nutritive value of well preserved silages I think you remember last week I said it won't take a really poorly wilted silage and make it better it might um, it make a silage just tip over the balance so it is a, a little bit better that um, it won't take something that's poor and convert it into something that's good. Some of them will improve aerobic stability of silage, which is important at feed out. Um, some add nutrients, some reduce losses, and, and, and ideally um, some of them will reduce the risk of a poor fermentation. They were they're more traditionally the things like acids which were used to, to lower P, artificially lower pH when it was unlikely that the bacteria could compete which was generally in very wet silages but as I said it's not it's not a good substitute for poor from or it's no substitute for good management so what do they do so if we look at the inoculants this is what they basically do they put lactic acid bacteria in sufficient quantity now it used to be at least one times 10 to the 5 colony forming units per gram of fresh forage into the silage so that those bacteria dominate the fermentation one times 10 to the 5 is now sometimes one times 10 to the 6 so you can imagine that 10 to the 6 is a lot of little bugs and a gram of fresh forage is not very much so there's a lot of them they are less likely to be effective on low sugar forages because there's not the product, there's not the silage uh, substrate, the, the sugar there to work on. And they are reported to reduce fermentation losses by maybe 2 or 3%. So that losses that occur when the sugars are fermented and the acid is produced, there will be some loss of uh, dry matter due to um, production of other acids and other compounds but by driving the fermentation so that's particularly lactic acid produced you'll get less of those losses but the important thing is what they do from an animal production or point of the perspective eventually so they improve the fermentation which happens more efficiently because more sugars converted to acid pH drops more quickly less fermentation in terms of sugar breakdown or, or sugar conversion to acid so there's more sugar they tend to support higher intakes they tend to increase digestibility and because the breakdown happens more quickly the, the fermentation happens more quickly the pH drops more quickly the protein perfection is better preserved so they there is less degradation so they utilize it pro, in protein more effectively so when's it going to work well I I would say if you have a silage which has a very high energy content so the classic might be a maize silage or you know of a, a very high quality high sugar high end protein ryegrass and that represents a significant proportion of the diet 
and you feed it to a responsive animal. So I would say if you've got a feedlot steer being fed a diet that contains a lot of maize silage, uh, which is high in energy, then definitely the inoculants will increase return. There, there, there will be a definite production advantage. But because it's got to be an economic advantage, um, we need to make sure that the cost of doing that is, is less than the additional benefit of the livestock production. So my example is, if I put a silage inoculant on a bale of pasture, which is medium to, to high quality, but all I'm going to do is feed that to some dry cows over, uh, or, or some dry heifers or even some cows over winter when they need a little bit of supplementation and I'm looking at maintenance. If they end up 5 or 10 kilos heavier at the end of winter compared to those that were fed the other bales, there's really no way of capturing that economic benefit. So it's, I don't see that there's probably a real benefit for it. Other than that single example where, for example, where you might have a silage which you have to make it 30 or 32 percent dry matter content. You are concerned because of the its low sugar, potentially high buffing capacity of getting a good fermentation. It might it will it might improve the fermentation enough so that you'll get a benefit there. But they're they're the grounds when I consider inoculants of value. And I'll just show you quickly some data here. This was, this was actually fed at Wagga. Um, there was a maize silage, and it was either left as is, um, used a broad spectrum. So this is going back a while. So just a traditional broad spectrum inoculant or a maize specific inoculant. And these were, these were pioneer inoculants, and, and they had selected certain um, inoculants based on various reasons, and so the maize specific one. Uh, was designed or selected because of its, its effect on mazes. You'll see there a couple of things. Obviously, the dry matter con is very similar. pHs, the, the ones with the inoculant are a little bit lower, but they're all very, very low. So it's all very well preserved. Ammonia nitrogen as a percent of total nitrogen. Now, there is definitely less ammonia and the maize specific than the untreated. So that would indicate that the faster fermentation has reduced the degradation of the protein. But I always look at ammonia nitrogen from maize with a little bit of caution. Last week, week we talked, or the week before we talked about less than 5% ammonia, excellent, 5 to 10% good. That's based on Forages that have got a reasonable protein content, probably, you know, that 10 to 15% protein, just for, for example. Maize, and this maize I can't remember specifically, but often has protein content sort of 6 7%. So if there's always going to be some ammonia produced, it can, re it can represent a bigger proportion. So I, I don't worry so much about it. But the interesting thing there is if you look at live weight gain, yeah, it wasn't significant, but but there was an, a, a slight improvement in live weight gain. But what was significantly different um, is the amount of kilograms of gain per ton of silage. I think if you pull the two inoculants together, you may it may have been significant live weight gain. So it it does work. It does improve live weight gain, and it does improve efficiency. But then you do your sums and say, well. Is the cost of inoculating worth the extra benefit? And in this situation that I mentioned before, high quality silage responsive animal um, and significant likely to be a significant proportion of the diet, I would I would certainly always use an inoculant. The other inoculant that we use now is lactobacillus. We will spend some time on this next week, but we talked about if you heat get heating, you'll, that's aerobic spoilage, and you will get some reduction in both intake and also production by animals consuming that 
damage silage. So that gets back to the mold bit that was asked about before. And my response is it's usually just the mycotoxins causing the problem. So if we look at that one there, you've got a maize silage. Maize is notoriously unstable. It can start to heat within just a few hours of exposure to air. In all aspects, um, they are very, very similar except for aerobic stability. You see that the untreated one became unstable in less than a day, whereas the one with the lactobacillus inoculant, which is just another strain of lactobacillus that we use similar to all the other lactic acid bacteria, it, it becomes much more stable. But that translated into marginally greater intake but significantly greater um, live weight gain. And that's easy to explain because going from 903 to 935 grams per day, 32 grams, all that additional 32 grams went into live weight gain because all maintenance and every other... Um, all those um, other requirements for those animals for heat and walking and all the rest, they've already been met. So that's why you get it. Now, I know we've got a minute to go, but if I'm allowed to, Sue, I've just got a couple of quick questions I might just go on to. Um, Scott, how efficient is grain for soaking up moisture for silages and it will dry down before cut? Um, example, late season maize. I've never seen it in maize. I have seen it in pasture. I've actually seen it in pasture where people routinely layer cereal grain with um, pasture silages and produce the pasture silages a little bit wet so the moisture is soaked up. Yes, it will work and the argument is that soaking the grain will increase the rate at which the animals can break that down by chewing and all the rest of it. So you'll get greater utilisation. Um, not, um, not widespread in use, but, but have seen it in Australia and certainly grain is one of those absorbents that have been used before. And yes, I'd also agree that for responsive animals, and in most situations, it's probably cheap insurance. Um, I think I think that uh, I've got a I've got a couple of other questions that have been thread through, and I think the only one I haven't really mentioned here was specific challenges with tropical silage or tropical species, and that I would limit purely to the fact that they are what we said before, they're very low in sugar, so they have all the issues that low sugar plants have in that you don't get much fermentation, you're relying on quite a rapid wilting and storing that in the absence of air so that you get a preservation, so the material's preserved, but you just wear the fact that you're probably going to have a higher pH than you would normally expect for that dry matter content. But believe me, I've seen some really, really good tropical species silages. There's certainly been a lot of tropical uh, kaikia, which is a tropical grass made on the coast that produces good silages. Uh, and I probably should leave it at that too. Thanks for that, John. Um, yeah, so thank you for your time today. As I mentioned earlier, this is the third of four webinars aimed at developing your understanding of silage production and use. So we really strongly encourage you to register for our final webinar, which will be same time next week, and this will be on feeding out and feed testing. Thank you all for your time today.